Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Polarizer Podcast, and Happy New Year to you all. 2021 is here, and 2020 is behind us, which I think pretty much everyone's happy about. The one cool thing about the year was that uh, most was the best year for the podcast so far. So that's uh, that's at least one good thing. And I got a dog, which is quite nice too. Some uh, some extra life in the house, which is always good. I'm sure he'll uh, make an appearance in uh, one of the future episodes too, as he wanders around and uh, shows up at random times. So that'll be fun to have uh, in a video. And I also have an announcement. The podcast has moved to a different website. You will now find it at Diederik.blog. That's D I E D E R I K dot blog. And I decided to do this because on my personal website, I have my photography and my writing and other projects I'm working on. And the Polarizer had its own website. Well, it makes more sense to pull them together into one place since I then only have one website to maintain instead of two. And there's there's a good crossover between the audience for my writing and photography and the podcast. So you'll find everything there. Everything's still the same. And all the show notes are there and all the information and of course, the podcast is still free to listen to on your favorite podcast platform and also on YouTube. I've been adding video to the podcast recently too, so you can check it out on YouTube. Link is also on Diederik.blog for every episode. And when you're there, sign up for the newsletter so you never miss an episode. I'll send out an email every time a new episode drops. And now for the sponsors of the show. First one is Alert. Alert is an iPhone app that generates dynamic allergy cards for people who travel. There's not a whole lot of traveling going on right now, but once this COVID uh, shit is over, and I'm sure it will be over one day, hopefully this year, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Let's say you travel to a place where you don't speak the language and you are allergic to dairy or peanuts or, or any of the 14 most common ones. You can use this app to generate a dynamic allergy card so you first select what you're allergic to then you can even also select a vegetarian diet if if that's your lifestyle and then you pick one of the 44 different languages that the app supports and if you press the button it generates a message in the language that you choose it's very handy if you're allergic and you are in a country where people don't speak the language so that's Alert, A-L-L-E-R-T, on the iOS App Store. And this episode is also brought to you by Amazon. Go to Diederik.blog and click on the Amazon button on the page, on the podcast page. And you will go to Amazon, just like you always do. And if you place an order, I'll get a little kickback from that order. And it comes out of Amazon's end, so it doesn't cost you anything to visit the page through that link. What you can also do is, uh, once you click that link and you are on Amazon, bookmark that page like that. And every time you visit Amazon through that bookmark in your browser, you apply the affiliate link from the podcast website. So that's a great way to help out. You just do your Amazon shopping like you always do. Only I get a little kickback from Amazon for taking you there. Go to Diederik.blog and click on the podcast link in the top menu to land on the podcast uh, page and you'll find all the links there. My guest today is Francis Aaron and he is a rapper from the UK who writes about philosophy, politics, history and books. And he is no fan, in his own words, of woke drivel, anti-scientific cold swallow and other crackpot moral fashions. And he takes an interesting and intellectual approach to taking this whole thing on what's uh, what's going on now with the identity politics and the, the whole woke happenings that um, the whole woke thing that seems to be pretty big on the internet right now so i normally don't really get into politics because everyone else is talking about it all the time anyway but when i heard his song problematic which is as a description a rap song about the church of woke identity politics and generation snowflake when i heard that song i was like wow this is interesting i uh, i want to 
talk to to the guy behind this and um I did we talked for a very long time and uh, it's very interesting to uh, to find out where he's coming from and he uh, he has a quite uh, eloquent way of um expressing himself and why he does what he does so enjoy this one first episode of 2021 right away a, uh, a very long one but I think it's a good one enjoy ladies and gentlemen Yeah, welcome everybody to another episode of the Polarizer Podcast. My guest today is Francis Aaron, and I heard a very interesting rap song the other day on the internet, and uh, that's how I uh, stumbled upon um, what he does, and I figured, well, let's send an email, let's talk to this guy, he's got a lot of interesting thoughts. So, um, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, t- tell me a little bit uh, yeah. about yourself. There's a lot of books behind you, I see, and um, I, I want to get into your yeah, song. Yeah, I'm in my lounge at present. It's, uh, yeah, uh, well, it's the cliche bookcase credibility thing that they have on <laughs> on the news or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a rapper uh, from the UK. I've been doing rap for years, uh, on and off a bit here and there over the years, and we just started releasing uh, a new bunch of songs, me and a producer who I've worked with for, for about like, yeah, seven, eight years now. I've known him. So we've just released songs and we're basically ta- tackling a lot of issues to do with uh, inverted commas, the culture war um, and all the issues surrounding that. So that's the sort of 10, 10 song project where we've, we just launched a couple of months ago. So we started with a song on um, transgenderism uh, and then we've just done a song on uh, sort of the woke movement and everything to do with that, really. And their attempts to sort of, I don't know, like argument type songs to uh, um, either break down an issue or to um, describe what's what the phenomenon is or the phenomenon as I see it. So yeah, we, we, we're working on that present. Okay, and so you're gonna bring out a whole album of this, of, of this, of ten songs. <clears throat> yeah, we're focusing mainly. There'll be ten songs uh, with with accompanying lyric videos uh, on these sorts of issues, and I will revisit aspects of uh, the different issues as well. So uh, the next one is probably going to be on censorship and cancellations and all this kind of stuff that is quite. Uh, prevalent in the in the press and the media and whatnot for the last well few years really okay. well it always has been I think so I think the next song release is is going to be on that <clears throat> topic oh we can uh, we can have a listen to uh, to the one I found um, uh, the one I heard first I saw it because uh, James Lindsay posted it uh, on his uh, on his Facebook yeah and um, you know he's a guy that also has been on um, Joe Rogan, and he has this um, website called uh, New Discourses. That's he, right, yeah. I think he, he he named it after, well, I think it's a, a play on Foucault, Michel Foucault, uh, like, who was obsessed with the word discourse and a, a, a type of study known as discourse analysis. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, James Lindsay's encyclopedia... <laughs> It chronicles all the different sort of woke terminology that has arisen, especially in the last 10 years and been adopted by all the mainstream press and uh, the phenomenal rises from 2010 of like word usage frequency in, in certain newspapers, such as the New York Times or, well, any name, any newspaper really. And ultimately, um, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant site, the Social Justice Encyclopedia, yeah, it, let's see. It, it describes all the all the made up words. A lot of them, yeah. All these different. He hasn't filled it all in yet, but it is. It's a piece of work. And James Lindsay. All is these his, words we hear at present. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, there's sorry? a little. There's yeah. There's a little delay in our uh, connection. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm afraid we'll we'll end up talking over each other every now and then. So. Um, yeah, there's there's um, 
uh, James Lindsay is this uh, mathematician, intellectual guy who um, did those uh, grievance studies papers. Uh, I'm sure you know about that too, right? Yeah, he, he blew up, I think, with Helen Pluckrose and uh, is it uh, Bogossian? And they, they wrote a set of papers uh, related to the critical social justice sort of fields, all these different um fields of study that have arisen in the last, uh, like, well, 30 years, basically. Uh, and a lot of this stuff now has leaked out into the mainstream in quite a big way in the last 10 years, since the financial crash, actually, I think, was the sort of the trigger moment for it all, or as I see it. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, and a lot of it's, it's like what's called the woozle effect. I don't know if you've heard of the woozle effect. No. It's uh, where someone produces an article or someone produces a paper and then it gets cited by another person who uh, quotes or uses uh, the information in the original article uh, and then someone else cites the next paper and then someone else cites another paper after that. Before you know it, you've got 100 citations citing this one uncorroborated source, this, this initial paper which was false or contained information that was just, yeah, wrong in some way. Right. And uh, it creates this sort of um, spiral effect, basically. And we see it a lot with kind of uh, hate crime statistics, stuff like that. We see it in the press and we see it like quite a lot with regards to certain fields of study, which they're just citing each other most of the time. What, what, what's an example of hate crime statistics? Uh, for instance, like the, the like we, we hear from certain figures that hate crimes towards uh, transgender people have quadrupled in the last uh, five years. Um, they they'll they'll be taking statistics from Stonewall, who will have taken a statistic from one study which uh, had a sample base of maybe thirty people here or there, and then it'll be it'll create this sort. Of circle effect and then they'll just this will go out on twitter someone will tweet about it some it'll get like thousands and thousands of retweets before you know it you everyone's believing that there's this incredible wave of hate crime that's suddenly risen and at the same time they'll say like arguments <laughs> for um the idea that with the transgender issue anyway that the reason why so many young children are now identifying as transgender is because it's become more acceptable. And so um, these two points clash, create a, a sort of, um, like, yeah, dissonance in a sense. Hmm. Okay. And in journalism, what, what, you, what you do see a lot is when, uh, what I do notice is that um, CNN reports on what Fox does, you know, and... Uh, the, that kind of stuff, but also uh, journalists write articles based on what other journalists do who wrote an article about uh, based on what some other journalists wrote and then you get this little that that's basically what, what you're saying, right? Yeah, the we a woozle effect it's uh, named after um, a, like a Winnie, and, a Winnie the Pooh and Piglet story <laughs> where Winnie the Pooh and Piglet are hunting for a mythical creature called a woozle and that could be your I don't know, your mythical, um, you know I mean, discrimination, hate crime, whatever. Um, and they're hunting for this woozle in the snow and they're tracking its footprints. Uh, eventually, they, they're, they're tracking it quite, quite a long way and they start keep, they keep seeing more and more footprints appear in the snow. And then Christopher Robin turns around and tells them they've been following their own footprints in a circle around a tree. Um, so it's sort of like a metaphor for how um, how these sorts of news sites function, really. Someone produces an article which cites an, a, a study or some study that has already cited something else, and then it just becomes like a like Winnie and Piglet going around the tree, following their own footprints, basically. Right. And no one ever gets to the actual truth of the matter, or no one actually gets to it 
maybe there are certain instances where there have been like um, violent crimes committed, etc., or abuse and whatnot. But it gets lost in this sort of, I don't know, like falsity, or at least that's what I see anyway. Hmm. But perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps they, perhaps they're, perhaps it's it's all correct. I'm not sure. Right. Well, one thing that I found interesting about those um, those grievance studies, like they they did some very, it was based on some very bizarre premise about like dogs in in a park or something. I, f- yeah, I, f- I forget what it was exactly, but it was just it was one of the most ridiculous, nonsensical s- studies air quotes that I've ever ever heard, and it got accepted. And I think they even got a prize for it, right? I think so. It was like rape culture. Uh, amongst dogs in parks, right, and uh, uh, and and how this, yeah, how, how it, it's very bizarre, and how that translated to like the oppression in human society or something. It was yeah, uh, precisely how it links to some sort of perhaps masculinist. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it it got accepted in some major journal i think they wrote quite a few papers some of them didn't get accepted some did um they rewrote hit a chapter of hitler's mind Kampf. um although it's quite different when you read it you wouldn't recognize that it is um you, you would not see it a lot of words have just been substituted here and there so it does it does have all the buzzwords like which stem from certain fields of study dating back to like the 60s um like post-structuralism Crap and a lot of these stuff. terms that have arisen in, in 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 solely these fields, but that now have leaked out and are have, like found themselves coming out of the mouths of just regular people. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you want to listen to uh, to your song and comment on it and yeah, take, yeah. It, take it apart a little bit. Crackpots are stopping nothing, so of course I'm gonna catch a ton of flack. Look, that man is not a bat, he is a man dressed as a bat. Back before cancel culture and the Twitter pylon, the campus cults were a ticking time bomb. And a storm had been built for history's most fortunate children. They knew no pain, no threat, no trouble. No strain, no sense of struggle Into an age of bias and barbarism Came a generation raised on a diet of narcissism Tossed into the furnace of the abyss They found themselves purposeless and adrift Lost in a hopeless exhaustion a wash in an ocean of boredom Drenched in resentment and pregnant with envy Depressed and condemned to be empty They had no goal, no elixir or nostrum Nothing to overcome this was their problem they sought to be seen as heroic that their lives might one day be deemed the theme for a poet what they needed was a target a purpose an idea that could harvest the urges they rake the dirt they dog manure to slake this thirst was such a chore if they could do nothing but clutch at straws they would have to create things to suffer for perhaps the summit might seem puzzling but human beings need suffering if there were no enemy to contend with then it would be necessary to invent it it's so problematic oh, deeply problematic it's so problematic deeply problematic it's so problematic oh, deeply problematic it's so problematic Deeply problematic They began to await goblins To give their lives meaning They had to create problems To acquire purpose and crack this puzzle They had to concoct fantastic struggles Monsters they would be destined to conquer From this came a collection of dogma A body of fiction that they piled in stacks A cluster of fables disguised as facts And they pondered the doctrine rigorously A church house of mad apparatchiks Concoctions of cosmic idiocy Churned out by quacks and fanatics from every the orifice the stench was smelt deep into the subterranean depths they delved when a trend then made its presence felt a pathological obsession with mental health the wretched specter of oppression the restless fetish of progression this infection was spreading like leprosy the mystical gibberish of gender identity a woman trapped in a cryptic weariness the phantom of lived experience the shibboleth of intersectionality a willingness to disrespect reality the block-headed gender fallacy The obsession with sexuality The extreme fixation on race These themes dictated the faith It's so problematic oh, Deeply problematic It's so problematic 
problematic. Deeply problematic. It's so problematic. Deeply problematic. It's so problematic. Deeply problematic. At last, a creed of grievance was built, and its task was to breed the feeling of guilt, to secure power, to make them feel filthy. The innocent must be made to feel guilty, to sing a political hymn to bitterness, repent for the original sin of privilege, enthralled by the gospel's passion. This command was installed as a moral fashion And as these flagellants ravaged their health The priesthood began to anchor itself A clergy of guilt-tripping chaplains And a neurotic flock of guilt-stricken hatchlings A rabble of activism would lay before a catechism That cast suspicion on nature And it had them thinking it would bring the hour In which this masochism would give them power The masses were tongue-tied now by a vulpine vow To turn the world upside down To dictate the terms that they shall use Through a great inversion of values a sickly cult with a worldview in which victimhood became virtue Strength and integrity were made odious Madness now became holiness Obesity became body positivity That speech would be restrained was a probability As they masked their bigotry and weak logic Masculinity was deemed toxic The meaning of man and woman had to be blurred And a guaranteed herd would hang on each word They mapped the battleground with such cunning in their world, man could now become woman And under the improbable belief he would flourish This impossibility was even encouraged A strange circus did invoke now The deranged worship of the pronoun To tame the uncouth and to mold its conduct They claimed that truth was a social construct These structures would be combusted Everything had to be deconstructed Eager to be judged a disciple some anemic sheep were sucked in its spiral Who felt their slumbers had endangered them Knowledge of these structures had awakened them So they styled themselves as woke Now the fires of hell had been stoked Draped in cassocks, costumes and disguises They would soon conclude they were righteous Slowed them, buttressed and soaked with smugness These wokish junters had grown in clusters Cloaked in the robes of social justice Their goal was to explode the structures They appeared from a trapdoor hissing and frothing Deridian hacksaws swinging and chopping Everything was absorbed into the doctrine Everything was transformed into a problem Everything had to be problematized And the mollycoddle colleges swallowed the lies They gobbled the dogma of the problem addicts And everything was thus rendered problematic It's so problematic oh, Deeply problematic It's so problematic Deeply problematic Problematic oh, Deeply problematic Well that's uh when I heard that song uh, for the first time, I was like, okay, I haven't, uh, haven't heard this kind of stuff before. Or actually, that's not really true. The first time I heard this kind of new brand of sort of intellectual rap, if you will, was when, uh, when I fig uh, heard about Zuby for the first time. And um, you, you know him too, probably, right? Yeah, you've, you've had Zuby on, uh, I think, a couple of times, haven't you, on the podcast? Yeah, uh, I was having a look. I did. A, I did message him as well with the song. Uh, he checked it out and then left a comment, so he quite liked it as well. I think. Cool. Yeah. No, he's he's, he's, he's a good guy. I think Zuby, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's, he's yeah. I mean, he uh, he's quite an interesting guy, man. He uh, he built his own success in a spectacular way uh, in a yeah in the last. Um, well, he's been working at it for quite some time. I think he's been doing songs and music and whatnot for well years hasn't he? He's, he, he i remember hearing him talking about when he was at oxford he was doing music back then as well yeah. so and i think he's gone and done, gone off and done uh, other things as well but yeah um yeah no the song is uh it's my it's my it's sort of a lot of like songs that i write are basically catharsis for myself really ultimately i want to kind of get all this stuff out of my own sort of head and put it in some sort of artistic form so the song is basically yeah a rant uh, about um what's happened i think in the last 10 years and how in my view uh, a lot of the the left um of which i used to like i still i'm quite left-wing on some issues um i think the left has been asserted by um post-structuralism which uh is like goes back to sort of like Foucault and Derrida, although they perhaps would, might not have called themselves uh, post-structuralists. What um, is post-structuralist? Uh, post-structuralism, so exactly. Uh, uh, 
well, you, you have to go back to like a school of linguistics called structuralism, um, which uh, initially suggested that <clears throat> I'm very I'm very much simplifying here, but it suggested that language is structured through uh, binary oppositions. So things like uh, left, right, up, down, backwards, forwards, man and woman, and uh, in like across the breadth of language, these structures uh, like largely work through binaries. Um, Post-structuralism was sort of the attempt to demonstrate, as, as I understand it, to um, to deconstruct. Um, these binaries, that is to say, to unfix them, to show that they are unstable or not as solid as we like to think they are. Um, so it was, Derrida was the, the, the one who sort of led the charge on this, um, and he followed Nietzsche in many regards. It, like The deconstruction project was largely, I think, an attempt to look at language and show that a lot of... Um, language has its roots in uh, things that have uh, have no relation to the real world in some ways that for I, I give an example up and down can be relative to wherever you are positioned at any one time right now someone might be in the flat above me up um, and someone in the flat below me down but like this is uh, like up only refers to where you are at that one time. I'm probably not explaining it very clearly. Yeah, there, I, I, I get but, you. Um, and I'm simplifying massively, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this sort of intense kind of um, obsession with language was the sort of key, key component, as I understand it, of some of these movements that arose um, in philosophy especially, and then these ideas sort of, were picked up by other thinkers, other philosophers, and through various sort of subterranean underground channels made their way to someone like Judith Butler, who wrote her famous book, Gender Trouble, and um, and then developed some of the ideas further or like ditched some of some concepts and then added other concepts to it. Um, and before you know it, it's sort of by 2010, I think it, a lot of it starts to gain mainstream credence and gain mainstream credibility, but in a sort of watered down form, the form that I think James Lindsay uh, is talking about um, with his, with his website and whatnot. So uh, the song, yeah, like it is an attempt to simplify what I see as the psychology that leads someone to adopt this philosophy. Right. So it starts with a lot of kids at universities um, or, do you know what I mean, they come from pretty decent backgrounds and whatnot, not really had any struggles and they need some sort of purpose in, in life. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm going to just pull up the lyrics. I think you also posted the lyrics on your Twitter, right? Yeah. Let's see, what, um, what would be the best way to go through it? Shall we just go through the lyrics or go through that Twitter thread that you posted? What do you think uh, is better? Uh, go through the lyrics if you want. Yeah, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts and on parts of it. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. I'll share my screen with you so you can see what I'm looking at too. There we go. Yeah. All right. So it starts off, yeah. Just a general, back before cancel culture and the Twitter pylon, the campus cults were a ticking time bomb uh, and a storm had been building for history's most fortunate children. So like a lot of like the massive e expansion of university, um, university attendance that we've seen in the last 20 years, especially, um, it's, I think in the UK anyway, like there was a huge drive to get more and more people into universities. Um, and someone posted a, Twitter, a tweet that went viral actually um, a couple of days ago um, saying there are millions of kids in universities who shouldn't be there studying courses that shouldn't exist and uh, imbibing theories that are wrong. And I think, or I think that's kind of 
true, really. This yeah, tweet agree. went ultra sort of viral. Who posted that? Um, a guy called, just is a guy on Twitter called Russian Peasant is his sort of name. I think he's anonymous. I don't know who he is. Okay. But yeah, so this tweet, I think it just encapsulated that little lyric there, really. His the storm had been building for history's most fortunate children. <laughs> a lot of this verse is referencing a sort of Nietzsche's philosophy. Um, I, I, I don't know, are you familiar with Nietzsche much? Or? Not much, um, but I think it takes years to, to be, you know. Yeah, so Nietzsche wrote yes. a book called The Genealogy of Morals. That's the one. That's it, yeah. There are millions of people attending university who do not belong there, enrolled in programs that should not exist in order to study theories that are wrong. Hmm. And I think uh, it sparked a huge sort of debate and whatnot. But I think the fact that it went viral is sort of a testament to, the, to its truth to some degree. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of what I'm referencing throughout this verse as well. And then a lot of these ideas that are false or that are not really grounded in any like, fact-checking um, are being adopted en masse. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, this verse references a lot of sort of uh, Nietzsche's philosophy and that I think human beings need some sort of purpose, some sort of meaning in their life, whatever it may be. And often it depends on the ideas that are lying around at the, at the time. So people adopt all sorts of, um, like, yeah, belief systems right. in that regard. So they knew no pain, no threat, no trouble, no strain, no sense of struggle. And into an age of bias and barbarism came a generation raised on a diet of narcissism. And an so, age of, of bias and barbarism, what, what does that refer to? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of talking about the 2000s a bit there, I think. Um, so 9-11 sparks off this sort of a political crisis in America, which then leads to the wars in the Middle East and, and then the financial crash hits um, in like a spectacular fashion, basically. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you have the millennial generation who come to sort of the age of... 18 at the turn as the financial crash is really like sweeping the globe in many ways uh, who were shipped off to universities in huge numbers never before seen in the last sort of 50 years and a lot of the ideas and stuff like is kind of leftist in many regards and I consider myself as having sort of imbibed some of it at the time. Um, although I only went to university for a short time uh, and then went traveling. What did you study? But, uh, uh, I went, I wanted to be an actor back in the day um, and do that kind of stuff. But I quickly got, I went down to university in London and then sort of realized it wasn't for me. And I need to sort of go away, figure out what I wanted to do and stuff. What made you so, uh, dislike it? I think it was uh, a lot of, I, I've never really fit in uh, in these sorts of environments sometimes. I'm quite like, I've got like a small friendship circle that I get on well with and we're all sort of on the same wavelength with regards, like basically just, just wanting to pursue art or music or creative stuff. So university, it seemed to me like a glorified piss up at the time um, and I didn't drink. So, um, yeah, I, I decided to kind of ditch it and go traveling. Fair and then enough. went to Europe and then all around went to like Russia, um, America, traveled all over really. That sounds so, super fascinating. I want to I wanna talk about your travels later because it's uh, my, one of my favorite things to talk about. So um, yeah, yeah let, let's, let's, um, let's talk about it a little bit later. Um, so we got um, no pain, no threat, no trouble, no strain, no sense of struggle, and blah, blah, blah. tossed in the furnace of the abyss, they found themselves purposeless and adrift. 
most of the hope looks as yeah i mean it it's kind of the um, I, I can i can kind of see what you're saying there it's sort of, it's it, when i was writing it it was sort of trying to reference nietzsche's uh nietzsche talks a lot about what was what he called nihilism um yes people think that nietzsche was a nihilist he wasn't he was he was opposed to nihilism he, he saw it as like a, uh, a like a a trend a phenomenon that had sort of risen in the late 19th century when he was writing um and it had risen massively there were a lot of uh, in the 1890s across europe there were a lot of um like anarchist killings bomb like people throwing bombs in cafes and blowing people up and stuff and uh, many of these people identified themselves as nihilists there was a nihilist movement in russia at the time as well which uh basically people trying to tear down the states at the time sort of similar sort of things we see now and again arise throughout history but this was quite a big wave sweeping it the american president i think in 1900 got assassinated by one of them as well um hmm. so this was a big issue at the time uh Nihilism comes from the Latin uh, nihil, which means nothing in, in Latin. And we, we, we find it in the word, for instance, annihilate, which means to bring something to nothing. All right. So yeah. nihilism was this philosophy or psychology more so than anything, where there is no value, there's no meaning to life, everything is purposeless. We're adrift in this, we're, we, like, we live in like a state of cosmic pointlessness, and we either create meaning, which Nietzsche said we ought to do, and we create meaning through art, through, um, through pursuing some sort of project, some sort of goal, or we, or we allow the pointlessness and valuelessness of life to either destroy us through suicide or through, I don't know, intoxication, the degradation of the body, whatever, um, or we actively adopt a philosophy that it seeks to destroy. And so many of the nihilists at the time chose the latter and went on like killing sprees or bomb throwing sprees. We see the same phenomenon, I think, today quite a lot across all the political spheres. Yeah, we see it on the left a bit, people wanting to destroy uh, structures that they deem racist, sexist, classist, misogynic, misogynistic, etc., etc. We see on the right with people embracing nihilism and going on these shooting sprees. Um, and we see it amongst sort of, uh, the Islamist types as well uh, with the terror attacks and whatnot. So similar things were happening in the late 19th century across Europe and especially in Russia. Interesting. And then... Um, Dostoevsky as well talked quite a lot about it. A few of his books were geared around that concept of like meaninglessness. And what what you said there about meaninglessness, you also see it in entertainment coming out of the current culture, like shows like Rick and Morty. You know, that's super popular, and that's you know, it's it's just nihilism basically, making it look cool, I guess. I haven't seen Rick and Morty. People keep telling me to watch it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, a lot of it's prevalent. I, I don't think, I think it's a sort of element of the human condition. People question their own beliefs and whether they're correct and whatnot. Religion once provided uh, like a, a unifying sort of story, which many people rallied around. Uh, this has been talked about a lot, I think. Nietzsche was the sort of first to kind of really address it full on, head on, and, and he proclaimed the, the death of God, the idea that people are losing faith and um, this will have consequences. People will try to keep the religious codes and the religious morality, um, but without this belief in God, which once unified everyone around an idol, um, this will cause issues and, and problems and like um, rumblings in the stomach, as right. Nietzsche called it. 
So, um, which is, I, I guess, what we saw in the 20th century, really, with the attempt to create brand new social contracts, brand new societies, new men in the form of like fascism, communism, all the sort of like movements that vied for power during the 20th century. New, new men. So, what, what, what do you mean with, with that? Uh, that's while well, the fascists, the Italian fascists, wanted to create a new breed of man. That was their sort of object. Um, they wanted they they the fascists began straight after the First World War, and um, when all the veterans, the Italian veterans who came home from the war, um, they felt that they were um, like uh, uh, they they felt that they'd been changed by the war and that Italy needed to be rejuvenated or changed completely. They felt that they were the new men. These, and that's why you have people like Marinetti uh, and the futurists who talked about all this kind of stuff. Um, and Mussolini was um, very much uh, like he called the veterans of the war, the trincherocrazia, which is like the aristocracy of the trenches. Um, these people who would rise up and rule the new Italy. And obviously it created sort of, well, horrors. And um, we see it with the communist factions as well, which arose in reaction, or they were reacting to each other. So, yeah. Okay. And what was the communist version of it, basically? The communist, the new, the new society, basically, a, a new, uh, a new way of uh, managing economic affairs, completely oh, right. without the abolition of capitalism, the creation of new men through that. Um, so, I think. Um, okay. So these ideas, yeah. Let's see. Um, next line. Uh, Do you do you have the lyrics in front of you as well? Um, uh, yeah, I I just um, because then I won't have to yeah. like do the screen share thing back and forth. Yeah, yeah, I've got the lyrics. Cool. Uh, let's see, nothing to overcome. This was a problem they thought they sought to be seen as a heroic, that their lives might one day be deemed as a theme for a poet. I'm not a good rapper. <laughs> what they needed <laughs> was a target, a purpose, an idea that could harvest the urges. Okay. Yeah. So, um, or you know what? Maybe, maybe yeah, you just yeah, so just read through it and and you know ex explain what you're what you're saying. You know, because maybe I'll I'll stop and start too soon or too late. You know. Yeah, I'm talking about. They sought to be seen as heroic. I'm talking about this sort of hero syndrome. People people want to see themselves as in a good light and want to be able to view themselves well. Uh, and people adopt ideologies or people adopt uh, certain movements they give to charity or they they uh, they adopt some form of activity which makes them feel better about themselves or makes them feel like they're contributing towards society in some fashion so um, if people can be challenging all the evils of the world racism sexism etc then it gives them some sort of purpose what they needed was a target a purpose um, and like you can, can keep, you can keep expanding the definition of what constitutes, um, these sorts of things and forever be chasing like the ideal, the ideal society or the ideal, um, like a world without any bad things and whatnot. Like so I'm sort of referencing all that pretty much. Yeah. But it's like what Oscar Wilde said, as soon as you, you set out to sail for Utopia, you land the island of Utopia, and then you look out at the horizon and see that there's another Utopia in the distance. So progressivism sort of works in this sort of way, and it's sort of, you're always always wanting to progress towards the next island of Utopia, and whether they get there or not, or whether they kill us, as we saw in the 20th century, who knows? I don't know. 
but yeah. Okay, you you broke up again a little bit, like with the, the yeah. Oscar Wilde. I'm really sorry. It's, yeah, like you said, uh, yeah, you progressivism. Is a, the the problem of progressivism is if you have reached the island of what you thought was utopia, there might be another island that's even more utopic, and you just keep yeah. on going until you, yeah, and that's that's where you where I kind of lost you for a second. Yeah, pretty much. They, uh, it's it's. I think I can't remember the quote. Uh, word for word, but it's something like that, that people set out to sail for the new, the new world, find it, and then they spot a new world and it, it the process goes on and on. Right. And but human they're... beings don't really change that much, or I don't know, maybe they do. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Next line. An idea that could harvest the urges, they raked the dirt and dug manure to slake the thirst was such a chore. If they could do nothing but clutch us at straws, they would have to create things to suffer for. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a, a Nietzsche talks about at the end of his, uh, one of his famous books, The Genealogy of Morals. He talks about how he believed that human beings created religion or created God. Um, and they, um, in order to basically not die from the meaninglessness all around them, they found themselves like awash in this ocean of, um, uh, like, yeah, valuelessness. And they, they had no way of understanding why they suffer. And so they created, um, an idol by which to suffer for. Um, or at least that's how he, he saw it. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a direct reference to the, the last part of Genealogy of Morals there, where he talks about, like, there's a famous quote he, he has, man would rather will nothing than not will at all. So that what that means is that people would rather embrace, like, an ideology of nihilism uh, than... Uh, like literally absolutely nothing people right. would rather so and and then actively go out of their way to destroy you and whatnot um well it it's what what you see on um on the news during during these uh riots and protests and with the whole climate thing you know and trump and anti-trump like some some of this stuff is people act like they're religious zealots when it comes to this kind of stuff sometimes I think so. Yeah, it does animate people in that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think, that, and it's across the board as well, from all the way like far left to far right. It's the yeah. I think it's the same phenomena appearing in different guises. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what I'm referencing. Of course, this song I'm mainly talking about um, the uni kids and and who would go on to become what we see now as the modern sort of left. Right. Um, I do, I did, I do have a sort of the workings of a follow-up song looking at like the, the opposite side of people embracing rather than having to create things to suffer for, they reject creation altogether and just seek to destroy. And so that's where I think you see a lot of these, uh, young men who, uh, like a, sometimes termed as incels and stuff and they they they're sort of in despair nihilistic and whatnot in incels i don't know how it's, familiar it's like uh like in involuntary like someone who wants to get laid but can't and or something like that yeah sort of they congregate on all these forms and whatnot and uh it's again i think it comes from the same sort of um root that this lack of uh meaning it's like in, uh, in, in their life involuntary celibacy right celibate yeah that's yeah. right yeah it's just sort of a nickname that arose i think on like some of these message board sites 4chan and and whatnot and some others um like they saw themselves as what they called meets uh n-e-e-t um which i think not in employment uh not in education or work i can't remember what it actually stands for but yeah you see you see the same phenomena on the left and on the right i think um the conclusions are just different in many ways 
Well, they're similar uh, in, the, in that they're both not very good. Yeah, they're definitely similar in that way, I think. But um, what's your thoughts on all that kind of stuff? Every now and then I, I do see stuff, you know, so every now and then I see just interviews with people and, and I'm like, well, what kind of, what kind of planet do you live on? You know, like did this, it's, I get a feeling you got these little bubbles of people who have a completely different warped view of reality, you know, and, and they, they both live in this same, same place, but they, they look at the world in completely different ways. And I don't know, man, it's, um, I remember I think when the internet has sped that process up as well. Yeah. It's yeah, sort yeah. Of created all these, some of the stuff I see come, come by on, on Facebook and especially Twitter, you know, there's, there's some, just like, what, what are you saying? You know, it, it's, I, I don't have a good concrete yeah. example right now, but some of the stuff that, that people actually really believe, I'm like, do you really believe that? Because what you're saying there is absolutely insane. It's, uh, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of that stuff really now. I think the internet has uh, massively accelerated the development of all these little online ecosystems, which are uh, in their own little worlds, basically, whether it be on the left, like Tumblr types or 4chan types on the right. Um, and a lot of these different ecosystems on Twitter or social media or in their own sort of blogging platforms and like spaces, although I hate that word, um, they develop and they develop their own like code yeah. almost, their own sort of ideology. And, and anyone outside sees glimpses of it or often through very like, partisan lenses, right. they don't. Uh, so when these things bubble up to the mainstream or leak into the mainstream in various ways, it's quite... Uh, daunting to anyone who's not like doesn't know about that particular little online ecosystem right. i think this is where a lot of the shock towards trump uh the rise of trump and and the rise of populism especially is over the last five years so yeah right did you grow up in uh rotterdam yeah where you are. Well, yeah. I, I okay, grew cool. up in a town next to Rotterdam. So, yeah. Right. Okay, the, cool. I've never yeah. been. It's a cool city, man. I, I would love to go. Yeah, once this uh, will. COVID stuff is over, man. Yeah. How have you, how have you been throughout this? Um, oh, working from home, you know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'd, I'd much rather uh, not have to deal with it, but... Uh, yeah, you know, whatever. I mostly feel really bad for people who have bars and restaurants. They've been closed for a long time. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of businesses have been struck around near where I live, especially. Um, I see a lot of places closing down. There's some some new things opening up. Um, not really sure, to be fair. Yeah, We've just used the time to really work on music and do other stuff as well. So... Yeah, I've I've, yeah. I've kind of been the same. Like I've been working on my creative endeavors as well in this. Yeah, uh, you do a lot of photography, don't you? Yeah, is yeah, that your? I do. Is that your main sort of uh, source of income? Uh, no, I want it to be one day, but um, but I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, same. It's a bit of a build up, isn't it? You have to build a body of work. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm still also figuring out how to present it and how to monetize it like I'm, I'm currently working towards um selling high quality art prints so just big prints and, and really beautiful paper and um you know yeah small quantity high quality basically and uh but i'm working on setting that up so uh, yeah there's a lot to consider as well we consider like t-shirts and merchandise and everything else and stuff like that or um i'm not sure if my kind of work lends itself for that you know it's mostly just landscapes and uh right and that kind of stuff so yeah what was the demilitarized uh zone at the north korean border like 
Yeah, I can, I'm interested in that a lot. I can uh, look up. Uh, I can show those pictures too while we talk about it. Yeah, it was that was very intense, man. I've um, I've been to um, Korea a couple. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll share my screen with you. Show my website. Let's turn this interview around a little bit. <laughs> um, I went to Asia in 2016 and. One of the places I went was also uh, South Korea and, of course, North Korea. There's, I still have a lot of pictures that I want to put up here. But, you know, <laughs> life gets in the way of that kind of stuff sometimes. Mm. Yeah, this it basically started with a bus tour. You uh, drive through this wasteland, this frozen wasteland. It was super cold. It was like minus... It was like minus 23 degrees Celsius, you know. It was, it was so cold that it would just hurt your face. And... Um, you know, you drive drive across this frozen wasteland that looks like unlike anything I've ever seen. And then you get close to the border and you see these signs that says, well, this is a mine. Uh, there's mines here. This, this area is an undocumented <coughs> mine detached region where a person could get killed instantly. So basically, <laughs> you see these, these little signs with mines. And, you know, once you cross this border, there's uh, you're going to step on a mine eventually. And um, then you get to this visitor center where this monument is of, uh, you know, people pushing a uh, broken world together. And this was built around a um, the third tunnel, it's called. But they, uh, the North Koreans had dug a tunnel towards South Korea that they discovered. And then they plugged it up. They discovered it. Then they basically put a minefield in that tunnel. So they put up a concrete wall with a little peak hole in it to, to just first block off the tunnel. And then they created an area of like 10 meters in the rest of the tunnel that they just filled up with mines. And then they built another wall with another peak hole. So and that's how they closed the tunnel, basically. And um, they built a visitor center there where you can learn about what happened there. And uh, Were you traveling on your own? Or, like, um, well... I can see that you're with people, but on your own in the sense of you weren't with anyone who, who you know. Well, when when I was there, my then girlfriend, now wife, worked there as a English teacher. She's from the United States, right? And um, uh, we, uh, yeah, so that was that was a good reason for me to stop by South Korea first because she was there, and um, it was actually her idea to go here. Yeah, I guess we really found each other when it comes to this adventurous traveling stuff. Um, yeah, it looks immense. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, and then the the next uh, next stop was Dorasan Station, which is like the train station that would connect North Korea with South Korea. And you see you see the sign that says to Pyongyang, which is the capital mm. of North Korea. So the South Korean side of that station is built and the tracks stop at the at the North Korean border. And they basically say, well, we got our part of the infrastructure ready. So if you guys just connect your rail to it when when the time is there, all we have right. to do is open it up. And this is just the, you know, the, the general area. And this was the would-be security area, but that's not being used right now, obviously. And um, this was the platform, and there's this soldier standing there to make sure that no one walks towards North Korea there. And, uh, mm. you know, his job is just to stand there. And from, what, from what I understood is that... Um, is he North Korean or South Korean? South Korea. This, this was South like, Korean. Yeah, this is all on the South Korean side. Right. And the guys who, who stand guard in this area are like the, the elite soldiers of South Korea. So they're... You know, they're, they're actually pretty big dudes. Like the average, I'm I'm pretty tall. You know, being being a Dutchman and all, and I pretty much tower over everybody there. But the dudes, uh, soldiers standing at the border, those were big dudes, man. They were uh, bigger than I was. <laughs> yeah, and then then we um, we got to like the final part, which is this United States base, and that's where uh, no. South Koreans were allowed further because apparently there's some kind of law that if you're a South Korean citizen, 
you're not allowed to get really close to the to the North Korean border. So that's where our tour guide stayed behind and hung back, and we got this uh, security briefing in this building. No pictures allowed. It was like a, like a military PowerPoint that we got, and we had to sign a waiver that if we get wounded or killed, our family's not going to sue them, that we enter this active war zone at our own risk and everything. You know, and then, then we got on the bus, and we drove through this, this very narrow road, which is the only road through this demilitarized zone. And, you know, to the left and the right of you is forest that is just filled with... Um, with landmines, so that's kind of unsettling drive, you know, you're, you're on this narrow road in this bus, and he's like, well, let's hope the bus driver uh, does not drive off the road, you know. <laughs> and then you walk through this diplomatic building, and they were very, very uh, strict about taking photos, and one of the rules is you are only allowed to take pictures towards the north, and not the other way around, because if those photos leak out to North Korea, that is a security intelligence risk, you know, because you basically right. give them information of what it would be like if you would, if they would enter and in, in the case that they would attack or something. Right, okay. That's then, interesting, isn't it? That yeah. picture yeah. looks very sci-fi style, doesn't it? Totalitarian almost oh yeah yeah it is man this this is the the, the border where you got those um, blue negotiation houses and the border itself is this concrete little uh, uh yeah line i guess and the north side is sand and the south side is gravel and those buildings are halfway in north korea and halfway in south korea right and, and that's where the negotiations take place okay and then that's yeah, and they got these soldiers who uh, who just stand there all day, like statues, and they they stare towards the North Korean side, and on the other side there is exactly the same. They they just stand there and stare all day, and hold guard. Wow. Yeah, then they're like statues, those dudes, man. There was another building further to the right, but we're not allowed to photograph that. Th that was like a watchtower on the North Korean side and they were saying well while you're here you're being filmed and audio is also recorded you know you've got these remote audio devices that pick up everything so uh, no jokes and make no weird faces or anything because they will use that as propaganda mm -hmm. and then we, we entered this negotiation building and there was this other soldier was just standing there again like a statue and he's standing in some kind of uh, taekwondo ready to fight <laughs> mode pose and um again it was it was a big dude man like there's if, if you go there you, you'll see some big korean dudes he looks tall actually if that door is yeah yeah standard size yeah and 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 behind that door is is north korea and his his only job is to make sure that no one walks in there because once you go through that door, you're in North Korea. And right. soldiers there can just grab you and then there's nothing they can do anymore. So it's more for to prevent dumb tourists from doing dumb things, you know? Yeah. Are most of the people on this tour with you, are they, is it like a, a mixture of different people from all over? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, there were a couple of uh, Americans and, there's, there's a lot of experts in South Korea, so a lot of English teachers and there's a lot of big companies there that have um, experts working there. Seoul is insanely huge. It's it's so big. It's uh, I think there's like 20 million people living there or something. So there's, you know, there's a lot of experts there, obviously. It was a little bit of everything, yeah. But th there, was, there wasn't a whole lot of talking during this thing. You know, everyone was pretty on edge. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a nice laid back experience where people just talk about the weather you know? yeah imagine it's probably yeah yeah and then um the next carries some of, yeah sorry yeah no but it was man like they especially after that uh, briefing we got you know where, where they just uh, and after you have to sign a waiver that you promise your family isn't gonna sue the government when you get killed you know that kind of confirms that that this is serious <coughs> stuff mm. And um, well, this is this is where we actually look into 
North Korea, and uh, you know, for people who are just listening, it's, it's just this uh, kind of barren land with hills, and and there's there's this tower that you can see, and that's like a, like a guard tower, and they were also warning like don't make like sudden movements there, and don't uh, point at it, and don't do anything because there's a guy in there with a big sniper rifle, and you know, don't uh, don't uh, fuck around. And this next photo is is the bridge of no return and if you ever saw the james bond movie die another day with the terrible uh, madonna intro song he um <laughs> he walks across the bridge as a prisoner of war exchange basically and um so that and that's that's that bridge and they um that was called the, the bridge of no return because once you cross that bridge either way there was no ever returning to where you came from basically and there's a um, village to the left that you look at too, and it has an enormous flagpole with an enormous flag on it. That's actually the largest flag in the world with the North Korean flag. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, it's it's enormous. If it rains, they have to take it down because it'll uh, it'll tear apart under its own weight. And that village in which that flag is in is supposed to show that. That's supposed to be a very prosperous North Korean village where lots of production is going on, and um, you know it's a glorious, uh, prosperous place. But in reality, it's just a bunch of empty buildings where they pretend that it's that's an actual place. So that's why it's called Propaganda Village, and that might have worked during and after mm. the, the Korean War times. But if you uh, look at it with a binoculars you just see that it's just a bunch of empty concrete buildings with doors and windows painted on them and this this was a monument for american soldiers who got killed during an incident where there used to be a tree here it's actually actually a pretty that's another interesting story i thought it was called the paul bunyan yeah the korean axe murder incident right korean axe murder incident yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah, there was a tree that that basically obstructed the view from the south side to the north side. And some American soldiers went there to cut it down. And then they, um, let's see, a North Korean guard truck c crossed the bridge and approximately 20 more North Korean guards disembarked carrying crowbars and clubs. They demanded that the tree trimming stopped. And when he when Boniface turned his back on him, he removed his watch, blah, 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 carefully wrapped it in a handkerchief, placed it in his pocket and shouted, kill the bastards. Using axes dropped by the tree trimmers, the KPA forces attacked the two U.S. soldiers and wounded all but one of the uh, UNC guards. Two, uh, two U.S. Uh, soldiers uh, got killed. And then they, the Americans started Operation Paul Bunyan, which is the name of one of the soldiers that got killed, and let's see that this, this is actually a cool uh, cool story. They basically showed up with with an overwhelming show of force, with like uh, helicopters and uh, overwhelming show Military of force. Military power. Yeah. yeah, and basically sent the North Koreans running. Operation Paul Bunyan was carried out on August 21 at seven o'clock, three days after the killings. A convoy of 23 American and South Korean vehicles drove into the GSA, which is the Joint Security Area, without any warning to the North Koreans, who had one observation post manned at that hour. In the vehicles were two eight-man teams of military engineers equipped with chainsaws to cut down the tree. These teams were accompanied by two 30-man security platoons from the Joint Security Force, who were armed with pistols and axe handles. The first platoon secured the northern entrance to the GSA via the bridge of no return, while the second platoon secured the southern edge of the area. Concurrently, a team from B Company, commanded by Captain Walter Seafried, had activated the detonation systems for the charges on the Freedom Bridge and had one 65mm main gun of the M728 combat engineer vehicle aimed mid-span to ensure that the bridge would fall should the order be given for its inst for its destruction let's see uh, in addition a 64 man task force of the korean south korean first special forces brigade accompanied him 
Let's see, and then, but let's see, the cool part of the story is a U.S. infantry company and 20 utility helicopters and seven Cobra attack helicopters circled behind them, behind these helicopters. B-52 strato fortresses came from Guam, escorted by U.S. F-4 Phantom and South Korean F-5 and F-86 fighters. Uh, you know, so they showed up with bombers and, and jets and helicopters and, you know, just... just an what year is this? This is 1976, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Operation Paul Bunyan. Bunyan, that's, right. Uh, that, that's worth worth looking up. Like, I'm, I'm reading the, yeah. the, the Wikipedia um, entry, but there was another... There was another... <coughs> um, website that was written by I think either it was either an historian or someone who was actually there right uh, okay and it was it was very well written I'll, I'll be sure to uh, to look that up and send it to you yeah yeah it'd be interesting <laughs> and that so that little memorial thing is to commemorate is to remember that incident then. yeah and that's where the tree used to be basically right yeah and you know, here we see the bridge in okay. return and um you know that that was it. Like I, I would have loved to take more photos, yeah. but yeah, they didn't really allow that. A limit on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Would you ever go into North Korea itself? I know you can do these sorts of uh, travel trips where you are accompanied at all times by some some uh, North Korean guards or something. It would be very interesting for sure, but I wouldn't want to do it for the same reason why I wouldn't want to visit Cuba. Right. My my money would go to to like a totalitarian government, you know, and um, yeah, I don't know, man. Weird weird stuff has happened there in North Korea with that uh, American um, student that got captured there, you know, for supposedly stealing something, and you know, I yeah, don't know, yeah. man. You w once you're there, there's uh, there's no one who can help you if if weird stuff happens. So no embassies or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. How how about um, you? Are you attracted to that at all? Or? Uh, I did consider it years ago. Uh, I think when I was in my more sort of wacky thinking phase of wanting to go and travel to all these like disparate places, even going through some sort of war zones, I considered going down to Chechnya at one point when I was in Russia. Um, mm. I didn't. I didn't manage to do it in the end. Well, you traveled um, to Russia, yeah. But like, where did you go? Well, I lived in uh, Russia for quite a while. I was living in Moscow um, and spent, I think Moscow is perhaps the city I know best out of any city in the world, just in terms of its layout and whatnot. I really trekked everywhere. Wow. Yeah, I love I love Moscow. Have you been yourself for? No, no. No, so I, I do recommend it for its history. Um, uh, it's very sort of, um, I mean, a lot of the Soviet architecture is all, there so it's quite grim in in certain ways um sort of gray yeah although parts of it are beautiful um obviously red square is the famous place um i lived in st petersburg as well for a while um that's a beautiful city built by italian architects peter the great uh like kind of built it on a swamp land and wanted to create the venice of the north Really, like the Russian, the Russian Venice. Yeah, that was his sort of object. He wanted a city that stood for Enlightenment style values, and he was one of these big reformers who come along now and again. So he built this city, I suspect, through serf or slave labor. But yeah, Saint Petersburg is stunning, especially in the summer. What brought you, what what did you do there in Russia? Did you, were you just traveling uh, or did you uh, work there? Yeah, or? I mean, I was doing various things. Uh, I was teaching English. I was, uh, I did go off and travel all, all around. I had a major travel trip where I sort of hitchhiked about Russia and went from city to city to town to town, visited all sorts of things, um, went to gulags, went to really? all the major cities such as like Kazan, Ufa, uh, and Yekaterinburg, however you pronounce it. Um, uh, yeah, Chelyabinsk, which was the city where they built all the Soviet tanks wow. during the war. 
yeah, just hopped about, really hitchhiking with fat, mouthy truckers generally. Oh, my God. That, uh, that's an adventure, one, dude. <laughs> it was. It was brilliant. Um, the guy taught me, one guy, Collier, his name was. I always remember his name. This uh, real chubby guy. I flagged him down outside St. Petersburg, like just at some gas station, and asked him where he was going. I was trying to go south. I wanted to go to Sochi, which is in the south where all the Winter Olympics are held, uh, and winter was on its way. So I thought I'd go south. It's a bit warmer down there. He was going. He ended. He was going uh, east originally. He was heading east. So I just got in and ended up five days later in his hometown, home city. Chelyabinsk, and then jumped around some of the cities there. Yeah, you should be able to see it. Where, um, let's see. So you, you flew into Moscow, probably? or uh, Yeah, I was living in Moscow, uh, and then I was in St. Petersburg a bit later, up there. Uh, I was trying to get south, going down past Voronezh, and down, uh, yeah, down towards uh, Volgograd, what used to be known as Stalingrad okay. during the Soviet days, um, but instead went east over to, if you pan out a bit. So big. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. Russia is massive. Further, so it's much, further east. Yeah, it's much for, yeah, yeah, you should be able to see it. Uh, so Kazan is there and Chelyabinsk is there. If you just, oh, zoom in. Oh, yeah, here it is. Chelyabinsk. Yeah, there. So I hitchhiked it. There, traveled around all that area as well. Um, and, yeah, Yekaterinburg is a beautiful, beautiful city. Underrated in terms of... It's not very well known by comparison to some of the other places in Russia. Chelyabinsk is quite grey, but I, I, I quite enjoyed my time there. Um, proper Soviet sort of style city. Right. Have you been to Russia yourself or not? No, no. I'm, I'm fascinated by it though. You said yeah. you visited the gulags? Yeah, I was staying in a, a small town city called uh, Perm. How do you it spell that? Be. P E R M and then but it's got Nyak is at the end. So just put Perm Russia, yeah, and it should come up. There you go. Okay. So I was staying with a, a couple who um lived in the in the town and yeah, I've walked past all these. Nearby was a uh, a gulag. I can't remember the exact number of it. And so I went out with uh, their dad. Their dad took me out there to have a look at it. What, what was that like? Uh, interesting. They, they, they're a lot smaller than you, you'd expect. Like, you kind of get in your head that maybe they're sort of big concentration camps, but generally they're tiny, like, little f mini fortresses. And... Uh, They've got like a work area and, and it's pretty rough inside and it's all decrepit. It's, it's like a real prison. Um, what you imagine prison is like. Yeah, that's uh, that's where I've been. Oh my God. So they're just, yeah, like this mini little fortress and whatnot. Oh. But there are tons and tons of these scattered about Russia. That looks like absolute so, hell, man. I think so. In the harsh winter, especially, it will be. But yeah, it was it was just autumn when I was. It looked like pretty much like that. Yeah. So yeah, I turned it all into a museum now, so people have a little wander around, and they've got the like kind of museum stuff there. And if you read in Solzhenitsyn at present, then yeah, yeah, you get some of these pictures of basically slave labor during the late thirties and onwards up until the sort of gulags were exploded right like the knowledge of them D did you take any pictures there or yeah i have quite a lot um i was actually working on my website to put all this kind of stuff up like pictures and 
from the travels and whatnot. Um, some of it's quite interesting. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, <clears throat> I think this all these little towns and cities are in the yeah the Ural Mountains as as it's known, <coughs> or on the edge of the Ural Mountains. Okay, and then where where did you but go really, next? Uh, I hopped about from town, little village. I went so many little places here and there. The major place I was in Izhevsk for a while, which is a small town there, just to the just to the sort of uh, southwest. Yeah, uh, I was only there for a while. I stayed in Kazan for quite a while. Kazan is uh, Tatarstan, so it has um, this in, incredible mosque. Yeah, so Izhevsk is. Not much to see there, really. Although it's it, it's good to get a sense of the real Russia, basically. And yeah, I, I was massively into all the Soviet history as well. So I, I bet um, they don't see a lot of people from the UK there. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. You see a lot of that kind of those Soviet-style monuments around, and then sort of contrasted with the the old, uh, like, Russian Orthodox-style churches. But, yeah, the next, one of the cities across called Kazan. Have you heard of Kazan before? Mm, no. How do I spell that? Uh, K-A-Z-A-N. But uh, one of the most beautiful buildings I've ever seen is the, the uh, not that building, this mosque here. It's pretty big. The blue sort of domed mosque. All right. The uh, the area was like um, I think dating back centuries into like the 14th century. It's been sort of settled by the Tatars, who are sort of Muslim Russian people, um, and so yeah, it has its own Kremlin as well. Wow. which has churches and I think that there is a synagogue there as well this is within within the, the Kremlin fortress of Kazan so it is it's quite beautiful when you go there I spent quite a while there we shot a music video there as well were you uh, rapping back then as well <clears throat> yeah I've been I've been doing music for years in various like stopping and starting here and there so yeah, and were you was your old uh, music uh, also uh, political or um, or was it more? Some of it, yeah, some of it was. I think this is a new development with all these new songs are a bit more explicitly political. Um, I used to write about all sorts, really. Although in my early twenties, uh, like I needed to polish up some of the phrasing and how how things are worded a bit. So I think that's what I've been doing over the last four or five years. Okay. But, well, yeah. What are the, what are the people like in Russia, man? Did you feel, uh, feel safe there the whole time? Or? Yeah. I, 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 I spoke Russian to a good standard. So I kind of, uh, um, I could get on pretty decently. And, um, Russians are, they, they have a sort of, they're very hospitable once you get to know them well, and especially the old like babushki, old grandmas who basically just give much food as you can imagine, just tables laid out with it. Um, so yeah, I, I I love Russians. I, I I got on like massively with many of the people who whom I stayed with here and there and made friends and whatnot. So cool. yeah. What's your experience of people who, who you've met here and there on your travels? Um, well, I mean, I, uh, well, every every country definitely has its own uh, its own vibe, you know. I found that people in uh, on Bali were were the most were super warm and super friendly and uh, very open and hospitable, like you said. Yeah, but most I I quite like uh, most. Asian countries have been. Koreans are generally, in my experience, they're 
you, you got to get to know them a little bit before they open up, you know. But if you go to uh, like Thai Taiwan, it's uh, that's almost like you're a celebrity there, you know. People people want to take pictures with you and. Uh, okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, and I think the Russians are the same. It takes a while for them to sort of open up to you. I think so if you always you, think you're American. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. Probably. Yeah. And they they have quite still. There's still some sort of, uh, I don't know, suspicion towards Americans. Yeah. In general. And you know, they those people have been through a lot in in history too, and I think that makes them a little bit, um, you know, hardy, too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the the few Russian people I I know, they always kind of have this toughness about them. You know, yeah. you you don't they don't smile that quickly. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. They're they're and you know, not saying they they never smile, but. They're, you know, you can you can see that they're they're kind of hard. They have hard eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and I, I went to America afterwards. You've been to America as well, haven't you? I saw. Yeah, many times. Yeah. yeah. So traveled quite a bit in America. Um, so it was quite a contra like a contrast afterwards. Uh, yeah. Did, did people at the border um, ask you some questions when they saw a Russian stamp in your passport? Or? Uh, not really, no. They weren't that bothered. Um, I kind of sailed through because I had, like, well, the British passport, so it, it was generally fine. Um, okay. I think only certain places the Americans get a bit uppity, although that'll have changed in the last few years, um, and it's a lot more stringent. I think now, especially, um, what did you? What was your experience of it in the U.S.? Yeah, um, I, I I get along great with uh, with Americans. Yeah, yeah, same. I think your wife is American. You said as well. Or? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of yeah. used to. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty used to uh, you know Americans in general. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Where is she from in America? Florida. Okay, cool. Yeah. Florida. I've never been. I didn't go down to Florida when I was there. Oh. So, Where did yeah. you go? Uh, again, I hopped about from city to city. And I was in New York for a while. Uh, then I went to like, Philadelphia, Washington, yep. D.C. Uh, yeah, Chicago, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles. Just hopped about. Yeah, all the major places, I think. Wow. There was a lot I left out, though. So you went so, from New York to Los Angeles? That's, uh, that's a long way. <clears throat> it is, yeah. Um, just I was either getting a train or Amtrak things. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. I, I really loved it, I think. I, I knew a lot of Americans from my time in London. So I had people scattered about here and there. The couches to crash good. on. Yeah, yeah. So... There was like a place for me to stay in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, New York. Um, but yeah, it was good. What was your uh, favorite spot there? Uh, I, I like New York mainly for the the history and hip hop. So it, it is his birthplace. So I, I went around all the areas that I heard in songs, uh, for listening for years. So I went exploring. Uh, really trekked the entirety of sort of Manhattan especially and then other parts of Brooklyn uh, just trekking everywhere I came my feet to like yeah my feet were absolutely after those couple of three weeks whatever it was um, I like San, San Francisco a lot as well have you been or no no uh, the furthest I've been west is uh, San Antonio Texas Right. Yeah, I didn't go down to Texas. I would have liked to. Texas but, is great. Yeah. San Francisco was... What did you do in San Antonio? Uh, I had a friend live there. I, I was an exchange student in the States in 2011, and I made a lot of friends there. And, you know, after college, everyone scattered all over the country. So I had, um, you know, one of, uh, one of my friends moved to San Antonio. So uh, I drove there from... Pensacola, Florida, which is like the, right. um, you know, the, the western 
Panhandle. Uh, it's like right under yeah. Alabama. Did uh, did the music uh, street like Fifth Fifth Street? It's called, if I remember correctly. And there's all the music joints and barbecue places. And um, yeah, man, Texas is cool. Yeah. Right, I will go at some point. Definitely, I think. Um, Have you been to New Orleans? Yeah, I haven't. No, it's one of the play. Another place I've really wanted to go, yeah. uh, just for some like jazz history and stuff, um, but didn't get a chance. Um, and at the time, I think I can't remember. America only allowed you three months to stay. Correct. Uh, so I don't know if it's still the same now. But um, well, right so now, I needed, right now, there's I, no I way really to get in at all. Yeah, of course. Um, I was really pushing it at the time. I think. I, I flew I, I flew back from LA but I had to fly to Philadelphia because all these it was the Christmas when all these uh, storms had hit um, and so all flights had been cancelled so I had to stay an extra week in Philadelphia I think it was and then fly back after this it all cleared up this was 10 years ago now Okay. so yeah how, so how, right now. how old were you when you did the Russian trip and the US trip and everything? From the age of 18 to till like 20, 21, wow. 22. Wow. So, and then I came back to Britain. And then, yeah. And then when I came back, I was looking for a stay in London. Stayed there for a bit, too expensive. And then moved up to um, like Manchester. Uh, lived there for a while and got involved in all the sort of underground battle rap scene in across that was happening all across the UK at the time. It was pretty big. Um, so I was involved with that for a time and then stepped back from it and kind of just pursued other things, writing and whatnot. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. And then we, we just decided to release these songs a few months back and... That's what we'll be doing now for the next year or so, slowly building up a channel. Okay. Whatever. You want to move into the rest of the lyrics? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, All right. You want to get back into the second part of the song? or Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your thoughts on the song? Or what do you, what were you and by it? Or what did you take from it? Um... I was like, oh wow, this this is a lot of uh, spot on stuff. It kind of um, ties into what people like Jordan Peterson are saying, and I was like, uh, all right, this this is definitely. It also it also caught my attention because it's you don't hear this kind of stuff very often in in well you don't hear this stuff ever in popular music that's for sure but not really yeah. in music in general and yeah well, this 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 like it's almost like a new genre of like intellectual rap music that <laughs> that um you know ties into uh, meaning and calls out um all the stuff that's going on yeah i think i think that's how we sort of wanted to frame it left axis the producer of the song he calls it essay rap um Essay rap. Where a lot of, yeah, just, that's good. It, it's just his term for it. Um, a lot of it's written, I'll write it out as a sort of mini article or an essay. Um, so I'll write it in prose initially and then take a lot of the lines. Um, I don't know, take any of the line, any line, most of the lines in there began as just like a, a, a sort of prose from a prose article and then I, that I wrote. And then just uh, layer it up with rhymes and lyricalize. That's pretty much how I write these days. And then do you translate it into lyrics. And, and do and you? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you? Um, yeah, that's that's the delay, man. I'm not uh, talking over you because I'm being rude. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> um, do you? There is a bit of a delay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do, do you actually have like books that you're uh, referencing stuff from while you're writing this stuff? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of references throughout the song. Um, a lot of references that uh, like to philosophical uh, writers. In the second verse, there's, uh, 
there's a little segment which is based on a tiny extract from a Norman Cohn, Norman Cohn, I don't know how you pronounce his surname, uh, who talked about um, like what was going on at the universities. I think he was writing in 1996. I can't remember the exact year that he was he wrote it. So I, I took a bit of inspiration from that. Um, and, and word usage as well is is sort of important. I think there's a lot of what is Nietzschean language, language that is sort of inspired by Nietzsche. <clears throat> so yeah, and there's there are many bits that are quite strongly worded. I was I was like second guessing a lot of lines here and there, but in the end, I just went with them. It's a lot of uh, rewriting there. Yeah. So the last four uh, lines is uh, perhaps it m might seem puzzling, but human beings need suffering. If there were no enemy to contend with, then it would be necessary to invent it. Yeah, that's uh, um, sort of a reference to St. George in retirement syndrome. Have you heard of that? No. So St. George is on his way. He's, he's killed. He's killed dragons. Do you know what I mean? He's, save the world or whatever uh, he's in retirement but he's got no meaning and no purpose nothing to suffer for anymore nothing to work no gold to work towards so he starts imagining dragons and fighting these imaginary dragons instead um, it was something that was referenced by Douglas Murray in his book Madness of Crowds if you're familiar with that um, I know Douglas Murray but I don't know I haven't read this book yeah, a good book, Madness of Crowds. He, he just looks at um, various things that have happened over the last, well, maybe 10 years, and uh, all to do with, like, race, uh, sexuality, a lot of the movements that have arisen, a lot of the craziness that has come from all these university programs. The Madness of Crowds. Gender, Race, and yeah. Identity by Douglas Murray. Okay. I think it came out uh, at the end of last year. I can't remember precisely. But, yeah, so the idea is that we all need a goal, something by which we, we need to apply effort in pursuit of something. If someone doesn't have a goal, they either atrophy, they either... Kind of, I don't know, turn to drugs or alcohol, turn to various ways to sort of fill the void, or they adopt an ideology or some something that gives them a semblance of community. I think you see this a lot now with kids on the internet who get lost in these little uh, sort of the people who subscribe to this like the gender ideology. Right. which we see a lot at the moment. Yeah, the stuff um, we talked about earlier too, like... Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, so it's kind of a reference to all that. But... Okay, the second, uh, second uh, verse. They began to awake goblins to give their lives meaning. They had to create problems. So, yeah. Uh, again, it picks straight up from that. They're People create problems for themselves sometimes. I think we're all guilty of it. We blow some out of proportion or we, um, I don't know, yeah. We create tasks basically that perhaps don't need to be done or we create more work for ourselves. It's just a natural sort of instinct sometimes. I think this is, the people I'm talking about, the university type kids, all these issues, there are genuine concerns definitely here and there, but largely I would say they've concocted these problems or at least taken something that exists, something like an issue, um, racism in society, and then expanded the definition to momentous proportions so that so many, it creates all of these problems. A lot of this philosophy, this idea comes from Foucault. He, he described his uh, philosophy as problematization. That was his sort of object. He wanted to 
find he wanted to extract all the different problems from uh, a situation. Um, I don't know. Do you know much about Foucault? Or? I know about him, but I, I'm not yeah. well schooled in, in his work. But I, I know the general stuff which you lay out there. I, I know the gist of what his work is uh, about. Yeah. Yeah. So his, uh, a lot of his uh, influence can be felt everywhere now, or at least I, I think so. Um, this the obsession with spaces that we always hear about is uh, Foucauldian. It comes from him. His first three books looked at. He, he wanted to look at history in a different way. He didn't want to look at it in terms of time as one thing happening, one thing after the other chronologically. Um, he wanted to look at it in terms of space, uh, like setting, place, situation. So this was his. Uh, so he, his first three books: the birth, the, the history of madness, the birth of the clinic, and this. Uh, well, discipline and punish came a bit later. Um, these three books looked at, the, uh, like the mental asylum, uh, the clinic, the psychiatric clinic, and the prison and the penal system and it, he attempted to like give a history of these spaces and how they have functioned uh, throughout history in different places and whatnot what roles they've played the scenery uh, so these are quite intense studies he, he saw this as he described it himself as like problematization it was taking something that we all take for granted such as a society needs um, prisons to house criminals and then extracting all the problematic elements from that. So do we, like what, like, what does society describe as a criminal? Who defines what a criminal is? Who holds the power? Like all these questions, um, some of it are useful and some of it we tend to take for granted now and again. Um, but of course, now this pro this problematization doctrine, if you want to call it that, has bled out everywhere and spread out and kind of taken its grip on many sort of fields in in the universities and yeah. in the minds of many people. I think with the the frequency of the word problematic is just a, a simple testament to that. Yeah, by my understanding, anyway. But. I, I remember seeing a tweet or an article uh, of someone saying, uh, well, if you if you were a white person eating uh, Chinese food with chopsticks, you're, uh, you, I forget it was either a colonizer or a racist, or, or both probably. But I was like, what, what, huh, what? <laughs> it's just, you know? Yeah, turning, transforming any mundane thing into a problem or finding a problem in it. Right. So many of these kids have been, taught to think in this Foucauldian way. It can be good in some ways. Um, it can be a sign of someone who questions, sort of uh, questions things that are often left unquestioned. But at other times it can just be like the article you've probably read there, just finding an issue with something that is just mad yeah. ultimately or stupid in some way but yeah so that's why the song is called problematic as well it's sort of a, it's the like the the frequency of this word now or for a while it became extreme it, it, you heard it everywhere and various things described as problematic it's become like a sort of ironic term now yeah um, I think people have tagged on to the fact that it had become that but it's kind of become a parody of itself at this point. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's what this verse is about as well. Them, they have to create a bunch of these problems and this church house of mad apparatchiks. They concoct a bunch of wacky ideas, uh, concoctions of cosmic idiocy, and then it's churned out by the universities and the people who are on these courses um, and it's everywhere. It can be like a stench, you smell everywhere. It's in, it leaks into all the mainstream press. It leaks into all media. You start seeing it on mainstream TV shows, 
like uh, Netflix, etc. And the people who have not sort of subscribed to this set of ideas feel a bit kind of um, alienated by it all. And the people who are very much have been possessed by it um, don't even recognize I don't know what's happening, I think, because they're in its they're in the stream itself. Right. So yeah, and then I think we, we, we hear a lot about it. I think there's been a massive turn towards mental health uh, questions. People have developed this obsession with talking about mental health all the time. In my view, talking doesn't solve a lot of problems. It generally creates more problems and a, an emphasis on mental health can be detrimental to health in general, in my view, especially for young teenagers. I work with a lot of kids in care, kids who've been through really rough circumstances, abuse, all, all manner of things. Um, in what, often, in what uh, place <clears throat> do you work with them? Uh, I was working for quite a while for the last few years with kids all around um, who were in care and I was helping them with their academic studies, maths, English, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of the, I was in care myself throughout my teen years. Um, my mom died when I was little, so I was in care. Uh, and a lot of the issues that they have are what we call men, the mental health issues. In my view, a lot of it um, springs from sort of physiological, like, like physical health issues uh, and things they've witnessed or things they've seen that they cannot alter and they don't possess the vocabulary or the the words to describe these feelings. Um, ultimately, all you can do is ensure that their physical health remains strong. That's that's my takeaway from it all. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm always a bit put off by this massive emphasis in the press and the media now about talking and talking about mental health all the time. Um, especially for those who've had traumatic circumstances, watching their mother die or they've been abused in some way. I don't think this is the best approach personally. I think talking groups can help to a certain extent and the, the child or the teenager or whoever, an adult, needs to be able to have people whom he or she can talk to. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit alienated myself from this mainstream emphasis that has arisen. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's the same with some, some people on, on Twitter or other social media pages. They put it in their profile. <clears throat> like they kind of say they, they make it a part of their identity. They, they want the first thing you see about them. The first thing you learn about them is, they want you to know that they're like uh, manic depressed and bipolar and, yeah. and name another anxiety disorder. That's not anxiety a is a very, yeah. Yeah. Or ADHD. Yeah. It's become a sort of ID characteristic now, hasn't it? Yeah. Again, like these, a lot of these things, are, I don't know, transits for you through state being down or sad or depressed or whatever, for whatever reason, maybe you've had a breakup, maybe you like you've been in poor health or something. Um, absorbing depression or anxiety, a part of who you are. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't regard that as sort of like, yeah, I, th I think that's probably not helping. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert on these kind of things, but, I, I see it a lot with the kids now and the new generation, the Generation Z guys. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think this pathological obsession with mental health ultimately helps. We right. see everyone from Prince Harry and to all sorts of celebrities going on and on about it. Um, I, yeah. And I think it, it has come from these university departments that have pumped this sort of I, these ideas out for a while. Um, and now mental health, your mental health issues have become a facet of your identity. Right. Um, instead so, of, instead of something you have to work out and 
try to find a way to to deal with and kind of move on try to live your life the best way you can you know yeah to overcome i think yeah well, yeah or or deal with in in a way you know that makes you a productive functioning person in society i guess yeah yeah um and that's when well i start listing off a few of the things here as well the um the the wretched specter of oppression the fetish of progression constant progress um and they believe in like i think the only type of progress we ultimately have is technological progress the real people who push things forwards are the scientists the engineers the artists who come up with the the sci-fi ideas in the first place and then engineers and scientists ultimately figure out how to do this and that's what leads to the progress as we see it the fact that i can speak to you now you're in rotterdam and i'm here and we can talk through you know what i mean yeah i don't think we have progressed morally um i think we've just altered moral values just changed a bit whereas a lot of the people who call themselves progressives generally are talking about like what i glean from it is moral progress i think i don't know um i'm always a bit suspicious of that because the communists and the fascists were saying exactly the same thing they were the progressives of their era they were the people trying to create the new world right. the new men or the new society so um yeah and there's there's not to say that that everything is perfect or things couldn't be improved or anything but when things get when people start talking about utopian ideas and and you know that's when i also kind of get nervous and there, yeah, there same. seems to be a lot of that like it never never works out well in, as far as i know yeah how much of it do you think is due to youthful uh daydreaming or youthful sort of ideas because i was quite um i would say left wing in my youth in that regard like utopian thinking and right. we can create a better society etc well, and since i've probably grown a, a lot more realistic well i'm, I'm sure well, there's there's definitely an element of that to that i remember when i was in high school and we i, f I forget which this is a long time ago it's like more than 20 years ago but i remember one class there was uh, in a book it was basically which I later uh, recently realized was postmodern theory, I guess. And it basically said, well, whatever you find reality is reality. And, you know, when, when I read that, it felt kind of weird, but I liked that idea, you know. But then when I, when I was like riding my bike home, I was, I, I was thinking about that for a long time as a, as a, like a 13 year old. And, and I, came to the conclusion but what if i want my bike to be a ferrari or a spaceship and what if i want mm. to have a million <laughs> euros in my bank account and what if i want to, um you know if i want to fly like a bird and then that's not gonna happen because i just think it or want it so even as a as a pretty young kid wrestling with that idea i drew the conclusion that there there is some kind of reality you have to contend with whether you want it or not but you know i i, I figured it out at a pretty young age i guess but what puzzles me is that there's <clears throat> young adults who kind of still live in this have, have these ideas that you that i think you are have supposed to have figured out when you're at least in your early 20s you know and, yeah um, and pe people who who what else the one thing that really bothers me and puzzles me most of all is safe spaces in college campuses like there's ideas i disagree with and therefore i want to have a little bubble in which i won't hear those ideas so i'm i can pretend 
they don't exist. Like I'm going to plug my ear and say la 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 la, it doesn't exist, it's, and therefore it doesn't exist. I'm like, that that's kid stuff, you know? That university is supposed to be the mm. opposite of that. You're supposed to have your worldview destroyed from all angles, and so you can figure out what's true, you know? And um, I don't know, it, it's it's like... Yeah, I think a lot a lot of people just need to grow the hell up, you know. Mm. It's, uh, and and for some reason that that yeah they they don't want to and and a lot of people don't want that too and uh, yeah. I think yeah, like uh, I suspect I wrote, I wrote some of well um, I can't remember where I've read about it, but only in the last ten years of adults started to take seriously some of the more wackier kind of ideas that are sort of springing from the youth. Yeah. Um, a lot of these, the gender ideology sort of ideas that have come to us through various channels here and there, um, and it's sometimes hard to trace where they come from, um, but have suddenly burst out into popularity, like declaring oneself non-binary and right. opting out of the sex binary as if that is even possible. Um, this has become a sort of little fashionable kind of thing to do now. And uh, they, they think perhaps they're who they truly are. Um, and the ideas are taken seriously by the mainstream or by adults and now it's been, like companies and firms and the activists are pushing it here and there and everywhere. Um, and it's wrapped in lovely kind of nice cloak, uh, comes, I mean, you get the chance to be compassionate and kind and fair by, so a lot of these movements are driven by, I don't know, appealing to people's egos and making them feel like they have to, uh, accept these ideas. Otherwise they're not being kind and compassionate. Right. Um, so much of politics now relies on that, I think. Um, and it creates the situations we've seen for the last five years. Well, it the, creates reactions. Well, the one thing um, that really kind of puzzled me, but that, that made me realize, like, okay, I guess this is where we are now, um, was when the whole um, Greta Thunberg thing happened. It's like there's this like 16 year old kid who. Um, you know, who suddenly gets to speak in front of the United Nations and and um, <coughs> yell at politicians, and mm. I'm like, okay, well, it, you, she can have her opinion, but it's, it's she's still a 16 year old kid. Like, what? Like, why? But I guess the world leaders have to take her seriously, oh, it's almost. because. Yeah. And then, then uh, I saw an interview. Uh, I read an interview somewhere with her parents, and apparently, she she has like uh, autism and OCD, and, and she got really focused on this on this climate stuff. And her parents were basically like, "Well, we're gonna just do everything that makes her happy, no matter what, and um, you know, we're gonna support her and blah 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 blah." And a couple of years later, here we are at the United Nations, and I guess the world is listening to it and taking her word very seriously like she's some kind of scientist or something uh, that that has this very deep original idea that will save the world or something I, I, I just don't really I don't I, I didn't really understood the whole thing to be honest then the next day in the, in the newspapers like oh it's so stunning and brave and oh, wow you know like uh, the po the politicians yeah. should listen to that, and uh, it's it, yeah, it, it it was just weird to me, and it was even weirder that people took that whole thing so seriously. Mm. She reminds me a bit of like these medieval child preachers they used to wheel out. They like a lot of these little Christian movements, and in, in the sort of uh, I don't know what century, thirteenth, fourteenth, maybe. They used to like have child preachers um, who like would walk through a town preaching or stand in the square or whatever. So it's a bit like that in some ways. I don't know. Um, yeah. It, I don't know much about it all, to be fair. Um, 
But, but the whole, so, whole thing that, that we should really care and take seriously the opinion of a 16 or 17 year old. No, we fucking don't. I mean, when I think of what, what I and my buddies were thinking uh, and even the smart, the really smart kids in the, in the class when we were, when we were that age, we were all, you know, just kids. Yeah. With no life experience, with no real, you know, we, we were just kids. And, you know, kids, and that's not saying that not kids cannot have interesting thoughts, but. <clears throat> I know what you mean, yeah. It's, it's sort of, it's become this symbolic, she's become this symbol almost, really, and they've transformed her into a symbol. Um, so, it's how human beings sort of function a bit. Like, we always need our symbols, um, right. idols to worship or whatever. Um yeah, um, we might do a song related to that kind of stuff, although I, I don't know much about it all, to be fair. Um, so I'd have to do more research on it all. Hmm. But yeah. All right. I guess it's what I'm talking about in this press as well. Yeah. To some extent. So we are at the trapped in the cryptic weariness, the phantom of lived experience. Yeah. yeah, this is a common phrase, lived experience. Uh, all experiences lived, so I don't understand why they need to put lived at the front. But it comes from, again, uh, a lot of these university fields, and now it's become this phrase. Um, it's like my reality which versus people your can reality, that kind of bat. stuff. Pretty much, yeah. It's like post-positivist, which means it sort of, it sort of denies any objective reality. It says that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's my reality, my truth kind of thing. And then if people can't agree on certain basic values or certain basic truths, if uh, people can't agree that, for instance, sex is binary um, and that you have male and female and that within these two categories, they're extremely complex and there are, massive amounts of variation and sometimes the variations overlap um, but if people are rejecting uh, something which has mountains of evidence like in its support and saying well my lived experience is that I am of, ni of, like, of neither part of that binary I am non-binary or whatever um, and they're saying is it this is if it is fact uh there are, then there's issues really with how people, I don't know, how, how we're perceiving reality. And then if corporations and media and politicians are taking all of this stuff kind of seriously, um, without question, without like asking, hang on a minute, like, what do you mean? Or how, how, how are you, how, how can you define yourself in that way? Then, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people would call you transphobic for saying what you just said, you know? And this is what I'm talking about with the sort of the expansion of uh, the, like a term used as uh, a beratement like that, like used to berate someone for holding a certain, uh, well, a factual stance. Um, and this word now, instead of it being, you, instead of you attacking a transsexual person or someone who like like dresses in a certain way or someone who's undergoing the procedures etc it's become this huge word that you target anyone with um so if someone says that a man cannot become a woman which is verifiable fact um it's impossible for a man to become a woman or vice versa um this is now seen as transphobia um, and so if, if there are plenty of people saying that fact or stating it on Twitter or wherever, or, um, and the, the, these kind of statements then are recorded, uh, as hatred or hate, there are ways to say it, which might be considered hateful, but someone stating a fact, uh, for that to be considered hateful or this is or that phobic then yeah, we, we're in a bit of a situation in terms of how we categorize actual hatred. And it, it also creates a condition where real like crimes 
like when someone is attacked or someone is violently abused or whatever, uh, like get sidelined because well, it's the old boy who cried wolf kind of phenomenon. People stop like believing in the power of a term because it has been so diluted and so used all the time on Twitter or on social media that it loses all its actual meaning in a sense. Right. So <clears throat> what do you think about that? About what specifically? Just the, like, when something is described as transphobia or, or I don't know, but plenty of instances where things that, like, a, I, I wouldn't consider racist uh, are described as racist or sexist or racist oh. or whatever. Right. Um, I don't know. What, what scares me is that people can have their lives ruined and careers ruined because people accuse them of being whatever. And once you carry that label, um, yeah, you know, that that'll follow you around. Yeah, that that worries me. And there's there's also like the the guilty by association kind of thing. It was I think it was a while back with um, like Joe Rogan. He uh, he you know he gets every everyone on their podcast on his podcast. And um, I forget the name of it, but but it was this um, this lady who wrote this book about um, transgender. Uh, Abigail Schreier, yeah. Yeah, like conversion therapy and stuff like that. Irreparable, yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah, what's well, it called? Yeah, it was, I think Irreparable Damage was the name of the book. Irreparable Damage or Irreversible Damage. Um, yeah, it's about the, the, the massive rise in cases of girls presenting to gender identity clinics now, like by the thousands, especially think, in the US. I think this is the one. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um, uh, Rogan got called a transphobe for even talking to her, and um, people were trying to get the um, episode pulled. Yeah, and you know, R Rogan doesn't have to care about it because he is um, he works for himself. But I'm sure that there's a lot of people who have opinions about this kind of stuff who are afraid to even talk about it. You know, I think that's the well, that's why I sort of wanted to start doing these songs basically to start in a different way talk about certain issues that supposedly we're not allowed to talk about uh, i'm just going to talk about them and i'll try and be fair and reasonable and i'm willing to engage in any sort of conversations a lot of my friends have always been like i don't know i wouldn't consider them like people who've swallowed this ideology but nonetheless like left left wing uh But then I have mates across the spectrum, so. What would they say? What would <clears throat> they think of what you're uh, what you're saying? Are they, are they on board with the whole uh, stuff you're criticizing in the song? Or some of them understand it, where I'm coming from. They might not agree with all like certain points, um, but it's the inability to actually like discuss certain ideas now, right? Without it receiving one of these sort of tags and one. No, and it's become like a cliche now. People saying, um, "Oh, you can't say anything." Blah blah blah. It's it's, it's a cliche because it's true. And yeah, but many that's, that's companies dangerous, and, man. That's dangerous. Precisely, I think you need to be able to speak about, um, and even I don't know the tech companies like getting rid of uh, some of these conspiracy theory types. I, I, I don't agree with that. I'm I'm pretty. Like I, I believe, I believe strongly free speech. The, the the way you solve issues, if there is an issue, is by presenting an idea or a problem, allowing it to. I mean, everyone from Chomsky to like, well, Chomsky was ultra in favor of free speech. Yet he could be considered on the left, like massively on the left throughout his entire life, still and still to this day. Um, the value of speech is, is that someone uh, posits a, a thesis, someone like puts a point across or makes a statement, they back it up with whatever evidence is available to them. 
someone else or another group or whoever meet them and try and point out the flaws in that thesis. They are the antithesis. Um, and then this creates, hopefully, through the back and forth, the, the, the sort of uh, the jewel of ideas, some sort of solution or some sort of synthesis, some fusion. This is the idea of free speech. That's literally pretty much what it is. Um, but if you say this idea has been presented in anything, it can't be uh, discussed in any sort of way or the antithesis can't meet that initial thesis, you immediately create a situation where only one aspect is being heard. And this is where you create violent sort of reactions, which is all this sort of ultra right wing stuff here and there. Right. Um, and yeah, and then if people are in one's paths, um, you get down, good luck kind of stopping them heading on that once you've cut off the ability to actually communicate in certain ways. Right. Um, we see this with plenty of people like getting shelved on social media, deleted, or even a lot of these conspiracists are chucked out and whatnot. So I don't know. There's, there's arguments either way, really, um, with regards how do you, like, these little bubbles do form and do produce sort of negative uh, consequences or and whatnot. Right. I don't know what what's your, what are your thoughts on that. Um, I'm probably not saying it as clearly as I could. No, I, I'm a very firm believer in free speech, you know, and because that's that's why that's where bad ideas get rooted out, you know, and um, yeah, and I'm 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 totally for people saying whatever they want as long as it's not inciting violence and not breaking any laws, you know. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that they were uh, that they're trying to, they're, I read an article this week that um, uh, Jordan Peterson is uh, bringing out his next book next year, and mm -hmm. apparently there was like a whole riot at the Penguin, the publisher, of yeah, uh, yeah. employees crying, and <clears throat> they they wanted to to ban that book. They wanted to that book not to come out, and I'm like, well. My answer to that always is, well, if that book is so terrible, why don't you write another book to counter all the bad ideas in that book or all the ideas that you disagree with? And, you know, if, if you are, if you have truth and logic on your side, um, you will, you, your, um, your ideas will win, you know? Mm. And I, th I think that's, that's the only way forward, really. And, um, yeah, when speech is banned, that's always that. That's just I find it very creepy. I mean, um, I I listened to um, to the Howard Stern show in the nineteen nineties. You know, it was like this uh, shock jock radio show from the U.S. There's clips all over YouTube if you Google him, and he would have these insanely offensive bits, and and he would he would literally invite like KKK members and goof on them and they would they would say all these insanely racist things and you know it was uh, and I don't think any of those and and at one point like I think like 30 mil he had an audience of like 30 more than 30 million every day and I'm pretty convinced that no one got converted to the KKK because of him having a KKK guy on you know it was just mm -hmm. um absurdist comedy and basically if you want to if you want to people to figure out how bad an idea is just put it out in the light and people can hear it and you know and that guy came across as a complete racist piece of shit lunatic and because that's what he was yeah. and and that's why it was just kind of funny and wild because they invited that guy on you know and it's the same with uh, kind of the same with comedians making offensive jokes. You know, they're trying to silence comedians now. People who make jokes, I guess there's some things you can't mm. absolutely make jokes about anymore. Now, I was like, well, why not? Like people get offended by it. Okay, well, then you just don't listen to it. 
Yeah, you can't police. Uh, yeah, and, and by like the way, that, that's another, where people get offended. That, that's another interesting thing to mention. Like Howard Howard Stern's co-host is Robin Quivers, and she was a black woman, and you know she was, and she was she was cool with having this guy in the studio because mm. by him saying his stuff, and people anyone who listened to the show would come to the conclusion any rational person anyway would come to the conclusion well this guy is not you know pretty much yeah like this is the importance of free speech it's not really done in like well it is done in favor of the people speaking obviously but at the same time the people listening to two people speaking or an argument or a debate or whatever a um uh, the people make the mind up based on how someone presents an idea. If someone's presenting an idea genuinely racist or this or that or whatever, I, people pick up on that. And I think most people would be a bit, you know I mean, against all of that kind of stuff on a natural level. Yeah. Um, people have their tribal uh, sort of uh, uh, like their tribal, uh, what's the word? Like not identities, um, like dedications. I'm, I can't find the word. Sorry, <clears throat> but yeah, um, allow people to speak in, in general. And I don't know. It, it, I hear a lot of stories online as well, especially considering uh, like I'm quite deeply involved in the whole uh, issue surrounding uh, transgender rights and and. Uh, feminist rights and all the rest of it. Well, women's rights and whatnot. A lot of the feminists on Twitter are quite sort of have their backs up about that. I think for good reason in many ways. So um, I don't know how much you know about all that. Or well, I, I know that there's some feminists out there who who also got um, vilified because they weren't like hardcore feminist enough. I guess. I think there's lots of different, yeah, uh, there always has been different movements in feminism. Um, I think the issue surrounding um, transgenderism has basically uh, created a new a new movement um, which acknowledges the difference between man and woman and like on a biological level, but also in, in many other ways, and there's always, like, you could call it differential feminism. There's always been that strand of thought in it, but I think it's brought it more to the surface again now. Although you probably have to ask one of them about it. They probably know more. Um, right. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. The rest of those uh, lyrics intersectionality is mentioned there too the, the sheer yeah, yeah. of intersectionality what is internet i don't go into intersectionality um <laughs> it was a uh well an idea put forth by kimberly crenshaw in i think it was 91 she published the first paper on it um it was the idea using like a crossroads sort of metaphor an intersection um the idea that if someone has uh, multiple characteristics or two characteristics that sit them in a, in a sort of a, a more difficult position. So if someone is black and someone is a woman at the same time, like the discrimination that they face is, uh, is going to be different to someone who is uh, a white woman, for instance, or someone who is like a black man will experience discrimination differently to how a black woman experiences discrimination. So her idea was that though the black man might be on the receiving end of racist comments or jibes, etc., um, a black woman might be on the receiving end of not only the racist jibes, but also uh, sexist ideas. So the fundamental idea is, I'm, I'm, I may think it's, there's truth to some extent in there. Now it's been stretched out into a whole doctrine, a whole wheel which attempts to take into account every aspect of a person's sort of like characteristics that can be discriminated against. And on the video, I have that sort of wheel of 
the wheel of fortune as it's sort of so it takes into account mental health gender wealth age all the types of discrimination that might meet someone at any point in their life but, and then but yeah there, there's how th- that wheel can have endless uh, in unlimited things on there and i think a lot of those things are also pretty arbitrary i mean yeah i agree i think that's i mean oprah winfrey is, is, is a black woman but is she, you know she um she seems really to be now. doing pretty good you know yeah yeah the argument was would be that she'd fate like they'd use the argument that um she faces discrimination differently to how a white male in her position would and she probably would receive more oh, um right. So th- this is the fundamental little core of intersectionality, this idea of intersecting discriminations and whatnot. Um, it's become, as I say in the song, a shibboleth now, like a sort of almost sacred religious-like value that has basically been imprinted pretty much everywhere. Um, shibboleth, is that, is, is that, I don't, I'm not familiar with that word, to be honest. Yeah, it's like a uh, long, because it's been like the early 90s now that um, a custom or traditionally a choice of phrasing or even a single word that distinguishes one group of people from another. So it's become this sort of, when people use intersection or intersectionality as their uh, description of something they subscribe to or believe in, it is, I don't know, like an identifying feature. And it's become almost... I don't know, sacred to them right? in some way. So that's that. It, a lot of the, a lot of the lyrics in the song will be stretched out into kind of songs in their own right, where I sort of explain things a bit more. Um, I mean, you could go on for days. Some people might disagree with certain uh, takes I have on things or whatever, but right. uh, yeah. And then the willingness to dis the, the shibboleth of intersectionality, a willingness to disrespect reality the blockheaded gender fallacy in reference to um like well the concept of gender itself um the obsession with sexuality the extreme fixation on race these themes dictated the faith i think they're the three core things gender sexuality race and this obsession that has sort of really gained prominence in the last 10 years and you uh, i find it interesting that you use the word faith there like you, as if it's a religion, kind of. I think I think it does have many religious elements. Yeah, um, that was James Lindsay actually wrote a big long essay a few years ago on um, how on all its sort of similarities to uh, religion. Um, I think after the financial crash, there was this perfect storm moment when. Um, a lot of the old atheist movement, the online atheist movement in the sort of 2000s, um, had destroyed religion, or they thought they had, destroyed the arguments of religion so thoroughly um, in terms of just pure logic. Uh, this is what they thought, perhaps. Um, then they, around about 2010, they started looking around, searching around for some sort of new religious framework and it so happened that this all this kind of stuff emerged um so it took hold of many kind of influential figures in working at newspapers or working in the press or the media it sounded good it sounded compassionate it sounded nice it's cloaked in these robes of nice sounding things well that's that's the Um, thing you know people the uh, one argument that you hear a lot is um well, why do you have a problem with it, this? Do you do you hate uh, trans people? Do you are you a racist? You know, uh, just be just be more compassionate. You know, it's a, it, it's a free country. Let these people do what they want. And um, if you disagree with this, you're you're an evil person. Or if you if you have anything to say about it, that's um, anything other than than praise it. You um, you know you you're you're um, this phobic or that ist or uh, you know yeah yeah um <clears throat> and i think that's uh, i can like it's the way it's some of these how these ideas have been applied now and how they've been adopted 
um, a lot of the ideas surrounding, well, we've already looked a bit at the trans, the trans stuff. Um, some of the ideas surrounding race, uh, which spring from like critical race theory uh, in the 80s. And what is, what is my, critical race theory exactly? Uh, critical race theory was a, a, a school of like, well, law that um, like sprung out of, uh, I think it was Harvard during the mid mid eighties, people such as Derek Bell were its progenitors. And um, I mean, it's fundamental core idea is it was very much U S centric U S like sort of, it looked at the U S legal system and it said that it's, it, it suggested that white supremacy, um, the idea that white supremacy is still encoded in U S law institutions, in the constitution and there's some, there's some aspects, no doubt, like throughout history where that's been the case. And it's irrefutable that black people in America have, do you know what I mean, had like horrors visited upon them in throughout history. Um, but the idea that this, uh, I don't know, this vague idea of white supremacy uh, exists within the institutions themselves still. And that even people, even if racism doesn't exist in people or is rare, um, the the structures and the, the systemic aspects themselves are racist, are set up fundamentally um, from motives or in history have been constructed for the purpose of something to be like racist. So it projects racism wherever it can find it or, or well onto everything pretty much. And then its doctrines have become extremely fashionable uh, for the last however long. We hear the term white privilege massively. Well, the term privilege from Latin privy uh, and uh, which means private and legge law, uh, like, Privilege refers to a law for private benefit or a law that's sort of instituted by the state um, and that uh, people um, and is backed by coercion in some sense. Anyway, so yeah. you, like the, well, critical race theory has found a lot of uh, sort of like currency recently and has, I don't know, found itself, like a lot of people don't, don't know where these, terms they are they have been coined by critical race theorists over the last 30 odd years um and whether or not these things are making things better i, I would say they're making things worse um and the the word usage frequencies that you see at the new york times that graph that i posted on twitter yeah um around about 2010 you see all these phrases spike hugely massively yeah, I got then, it here, uh, here in front of me. Like sexism, yeah. misogyny, sexist, patriarchy. It's uh, it's all a pretty flat line, but then it just uh, comes out of nowhere. Around 2010, so this is before Trump. All of it, you look at all of it. Like, yeah, racism just has a huge spike. Racist, racists, institutional racism, huge spike. Systemic racism, whiteness, white privilege, white nationalism, white supremacy, KKK. And then all the stuff to do with gender, non-binary, gender, gender identity, transgender, gender neutral, etc., and so on and so forth. Implicit bias. Um, uh, yeah. Fat shaming is another interesting one. Yeah. So a lot of these things emerge. Um, I think, like, like in that perfect storm moment where the. Like we're in the aftermath of the financial crash. Capitalism seems to have failed. You've got the Occupy movement um, in the press. You've got various other things going on. Um, the atheist online movement, which was one of the big movements in the sort of uh, in the two thousands, um, is searching around for some new project to get its teeth into. And all of this stuff, I can't remember who said it, but the great big 
shifts or crises that happen. It depends on the ideas lying around. All this stuff was the critical social justice theories were the ideas that were lying around. Here come the cops again, to arrest us. Yeah, that's outside. <laughs> <laughs> or police. Probably. Can you hear that clearly? Or Yeah, yeah. It sounds uh, pretty yeah. loud too, man. It is, yeah. I'm, 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 no, I think it's just uh, the road heading down there. But yeah. Sorry for the intrusion, but... <clears throat> but um, yeah, so... Yeah, we got the, um, yeah, okay, yeah. So that's that's interesting how um, how those subjects suddenly spike there. What, what do you think is the main cause be- for that? Um, I think like they, I mean, these ideas were have been around for a lot longer uh, than the last ten years, um, and many of them, I think. You've got to really look at the history of the left, uh, ultimately. Uh, I think after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Marxism massively fell out of fashion. Uh, and this late sort of 80s period um, was when the left really altered course. And instead of like holding class as its core concern, as it did prior to that and throughout the 20th century, really, um, suddenly all these identity issues sprang to the fore. uh, And you see it in the 90s. And then these identity issues became quite popular and gained favour. And then all the critical social justice ideas that were based on some of this stuff um, sprang to prominence after after the financial crash and were adopted by many of the mainstream, uh, I don't know, people who'd come out of universities and who went to work at companies, firms and corporations, people who went to work for uh, papers like the New York Times or wherever. And slowly this sort of, from how it looks to me, it looks like this sort of eked into every, everywhere basically, a sort of idea that spread Have you ever considered uh, writing this kind of stuff in in a book or something, or is this the way you express your ideas and your... uh... Uh, Yeah, no, I'm writing tons on, tons and tons in documents. I've got just reams of it. The the problem is a lot of it's all chaotic and all over the place at the moment. I haven't sort of, like, streamlined it all. The songs are attempt to roughly streamline, like, a topic into... Try and simplify it, although this song was not that simple. And um, talking about that with my mate last night, um, like the first song we did uh, was quite simplistic in its arguments. It just tried to boil it down to the core things. This is a bit more complex, and the word use is a bit, yeah, a bit more going on. Um, but it's just kind of, I don't know, that's what art is, I think, really, just sort of produce some. See, see how it is and then just keep building on it until you're sort of happy with it, put it out and then try and simplify and make better or make more skillful or alter it a bit. Right. Um, that's my approach anyway. But and you're going to make uh, ten, 10 of these songs in total? Maybe more, I don't know. But we, the, our, our goal is very simple. Ten, 10 songs, 10 lyric videos like this all of the songs are sort of linked thematically around these sorts of issues. Um, And it's a badass project, man. Yeah. It's, we call it the the culture war project inverted commas. Um, So uh, we've got, and then we'll, we do, we do all this stuff as well. It's not all done. This isn't the only topic I talk about, but yeah. So I just thought these issues are massive right now. Uh, have been have been brought to sort of mainstream prominence and I don't know I don't see anyone else talking about it people just either go along with the sort of herd like mentality or um, only people talking about it like people on Twitter or the sort of intellectual types who discuss it on podcasts and whatnot no one talks about it in a song so right. thought 
there might be a gap there. So we'll try and see what happens with it. Cool. But yeah. Well, but yeah, I, I look forward to uh, discuss the rest of it. Um, so far, this has oh, been yeah. very interesting. Okay, cool. And, uh, yeah, I hope I've not sort of bored you with no, no, man, and not about. not at all. It, it's uh, it was great. It was uh, I've I've really really enjoyed this. Uh, like the, the only only thing that I that that I didn't like is the the you know the connection problems every now and then. But that's you know that's just circumstances yeah. that we can't really help, I guess. Um, but the, I've, I've been, I will. I'll, yeah, I've, I've really, really enjoyed the conversation, man. Yeah, likewise. And um, uh, I'll give you a message tomorrow, and we'll set a day to just do the final bits if you want. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm actually writing a lot about all the th all the little bits at the moment, so you might see some stuff on Twitter pop up like in the next couple of days as well. So. Okay. Yeah, I need to post a bit more on Twitter. I'll be sure to keep an eye on it, man. Uh, yeah, cool. It's, uh, right, well, uh, yeah, I'll chat to you tomorrow then, yeah? Yes, sir, yeah. That's, okay, um, cool. It, it, um, if, if I added this together into one big thing, it's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be a big, interesting one, man. It's, uh, hopefully, yeah. Um, I think there'll be quite a lot of bits, maybe cut out or whatever, but, yeah. Um, right, cool. I'll, I'll speak to you... Uh, I'll speak to you tomorrow. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Looking forward yeah, to Yeah, likewise, man. Thank you for having me on as well. Uh, I appreciate it. I think this will be my first sort of ever podcast. I don't think I've... I've not, yeah, I've not, never chatted with my mates and whatnot. We've recorded it, but never actually been on a podcast. So, well, yeah. I hope, uh, I hope it'll be uh, one of many for you. Perhaps, yeah. We'll see. I would like to... I would like to do it more I need to streamline what I think about things though but yeah thank you thank you very much and welcome um, and thank you yeah I'll chat to you later yes see sir you see ya alright cool yeah bye 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 well that was quite an interesting episode wasn't it go to dedrick.blog to find all the show notes and all the information regarding this episode and be sure to find Francis on Twitter, that's Francis Aaron UK. You can find him there, and uh, also find him on YouTube. If you look for Francis Aaron, you will find him. That's spelled F R A N C I S A A R O N. And uh, if you go to Dietrich.blog, be sure to sign up for the newsletter and click the link to our sponsors to uh, help the show out and keep this pirate ship going. And that's it. First episode of the year. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next time. It seems.